Hello, everyone. My name is Nicholas Gruss. I'm an analyst at ARC working on the next generation internet theme, and I cover broadly digital entertainment. And I'm really excited to get into this next sec section on Web3 and the internet revolution. Um, and first, I'd also just like to uh, explain how this um, section ties into the digital consumer section that we'll be touching on later in the presentations. Um, and, you know, in this slide, uh, slide deck, we'll be talking about Web3 and what Web3 means uh, for the internet. Um, and in the digital consumer section, we'll be largely talking about the Web2 ecosystem. And I bring this up just to state that, you know, the differences between Web3 and Web2 are really at the heart of this presentation. Um, so to start, we can, you know, just move right into this first slide um, in which we show that main central difference. Um, and, you know, what makes Web3 different from Web2 we think it boils down to digital ownership. And in the traditional Web2 model, a centralized platform sits in a rent-seeking position between us as consumers, businesses, creators, and our digital assets, identity, and data. However, with the advent and adoption of blockchain technologies, uh, this model is largely flipped on its head, meaning users, businesses, creators are able to fully own their digital lives if they choose, um, without having to interact with a central aggregator or platform. And we think this is going to have enormous implications over the long term and help redefine consumer preferences uh, when it comes to spending online. This is really at the heart of this presentation is how does this idea, this concept around digital ownership of digital assets change our preferences over time and our willingness to spend online. And so as we get into this next slide, I just want to one, take a step back and, and talk about this year because this has been a very momentous year for the Web3 ecosystem, uh, for NFTs specifically. For those not familiar with non-fungible tokens, we think they're a great example of a technology built on public blockchains that represent digital ownership and digital verification of that ownership. And so just to you know, briefly give an, um, uh, uh, um, uh, an example, um, you know, NFTs can be a wide ranging uh, use case for many different um, assets um, in the digital world. You know, the imagination is kind of the limit here. Um, but what we think, you know, non fungible tokens really are, they serve as smart contracts that verify the ownership of digital assets on public blockchain. So you'll hear non fungible tokens, you'll hear the word NFT thrown around a lot. Um, but really what they are, they are smart contracts that verify the ownership of digital assets on public blockchains. Um, and we think, you know, this year for them, not only have we seen a broadening of their use cases in terms of collectibles, art, in virtual worlds, utility, we'll get into this a bit later on in the presentation, but this has been a momentous year in terms of user growth and number of sales. So in 2021, NFTs generated 21 billion in sales and the number of monthly unique buyers soared nearly eightfold to more than 700,000. So again, still early days, but seeing really strong growth, showing that this idea, this concept around digital ownership and digital assets is starting to resonate uh, with internet users. So onto this next slide, and, and Frank just did a, a great job talking about Ethereum and what Ethereum has become. Uh, we wanted to just highlight for you where this activity in the NFT space is happening. Um, and we're seeing a lot of that activity take place on the Ethereum blockchain and Ethereum side chains. Um, and so this is, you know, not to say that it's always going to be this way, um, that Ethereum is today, yes, the dominant platform for this activity, uh, but over time competing blockchains may offer, uh, you know, something that the NFT community has been looking for. Um, so we're not saying Ethereum is going to be the dominant chain forever. It could very well likely be the case. Um, but what we are saying is that this idea around non-fungible tokens, this idea around digital um, ownership is here to stay in some form or another and on some blockchain, blockchain or another. Um, and it's a really strong concept. And so as we look at this market today, you know, we touched on a few of the use cases um, and we're highlighting here in this slide uh, for you just some of you know, the ways to break out what the market looks like today. You know, of that $21 billion in sales, you know, where is that happening? You know, what are these NFTs? You know, NFT is a broad term, Web3 is a broad term. So how do we break this out? How do we give you kind of a rough estimation of what this market breaks out to? Um, and we think this does a pretty good job. You know, collectibles, art, virtual worlds, gaming and utility. Um, and what we think is really interesting 
is at the intersection. So when you start to blend collectibles with virtual worlds and gaming with art and, and, and you bring utility, so this digital asset having some real world application to it or use case to it, uh, we think that's really what's going to drive this next leg of growth. You know, and I think it's really hard to understand, you know, what this looks like in five to 10 years, much like it would have been very hard to understand what the App Store would have meant uh, for the mobile uh, connected internet in 07, 08. That's really where we are. We're in, we're in inning one. We're in, you know, year two, three of this movement. Um, and that's, you know, to say the same about 07, 08 when the App Store first launched, to have tried to predict, you know, Uber, Airbnb, all of these different applications that would arise, the trillions of value that would accrue to the App Store. We're kind of in that same moment with non-fungible tokens where we can understand the concept, we can see how it's going to play an important role in our lives. Uh, but, oh, but right now trying to map out and list all of the different applications for them uh, is going to be really hard. We're just trying to highlight for you how important this idea of taking digital identity ownership and handing it back over to the user because we've gone through decades of having centralized aggregators own and control our data and assets. Now we're handing it back if you want it uh, for, for users, businesses, and creators. Um, and we think this is going to vastly change how we interact again with our online uh, world and, and these virtual worlds that are going to pop up because of the metaverse and all of these different exciting new technologies that are arising. Um, and, you know, just to continue on here in terms of, you know, this blending, this merging, uh, kind of the blurring of the lines of sorts between what consumption and investment could look like as non-fungible tokens, as uh, digital ownership arises in, in this new world. Um, and we give this example quickly here just to go over it briefly. You know, purchasing a physical piece of clothing today, what are you what are you able to do to it? Understanding also that you're going to wear it, there's going to be wear and tear. Uh, but now let's you know take that example of a of, of a purchasing digital clothing in in one of the virtual worlds we had just shown on the screen. So think about the sandbox or decentral end. You know, we're talking about bits, not atoms. So there's no depreciation, there's no wear and tear. How do we view those pieces of 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 how do we view those digital assets over time? as they are not depreciating, you know, if you purchase a digital car and drive it off a, a lot in a virtual world, what happens to it? It doesn't lose its value instantly. It's the same car today as it will be in, in five years because we're talking again about bits and not atoms. So this understanding this we think is really critical to understanding how these assets could actually hold value over time if that's the intended purpose of them. And also I would like to maybe preface here that this is a double-edged sword, right? This could lead to very speculative and risky investments. We're probably already starting to see some of that in the NFT market just because it's gotten so big so fast. Um, but we think that what's going to happen over time is that this speculative uh, behavior is going to narrow. And what we'll, we'll be left with is digitally native economic activity that really mimics what we see in the real world. Again, what we're being able to do with non-fungible tokens and public blockchains is port, of, port over some of the real world characteristics of the economy now into the digital world, scarcity, all of, this, the, all of these characteristics that are needed to have digital economies are now right here uh, for us to use and, and to experiment with. And I think there's no better example in terms of this experimentation and how this could end up looking in terms of you know, digital entertainment uh, than in the public or, or the, the blockchain based gaming space. Um, you know, we're starting to see examples. Axie Infinity is a great one. I'll go into it in just a second. But where we're starting to see a new monetization method within the gaming space arise because of non fungible tokens, because of what public blockchains allow. And, you know, let's go all the way back and please, you know, look at this chart. You know, we went all the way back. If you go all the way back to 1970s when video games started to first hit the scene, you know, you had to pay to play. This was the first monetization method. It's still around today. One monetization, one mon new monetization method doesn't mean that a, a previous one dies out. Actually, it just, you know, expands the market. And that's hopefully what you're seeing in this chart. Um, but you had pay to play as, you know, the primary monetization method for decades. Um, then comes the iPhone and, and mobile devices, and we started to get app uh, mobile games and free to play. So free to play was you know, releasing a game, not monetizing at the front end, but actually monetizing at the back end. 
and selling of either digital goods, currencies. I would, you know, ask you to go read our uh, big ideas from last year. We went over that in, in a bit of depth as well. Um, and now what we're seeing because of blockchain is play and earn, not play to earn. We want to make that very distinct, um, not play earn because we don't want the driving function of why you play something to be that you're going to earn money, but just that the option is there. And this is, you know, a great example, again, is Axie Infinity. This game came on the scene. It blew up out of nowhere. The popularity, uh, you know, it hit all time highs, I would say, in, in the summer. It's super popular still in the Philippines. And what we've seen is that you're able to breed, and I'll just go into a little bit of depth here in terms of the game itself, but you're able to breed and fight these Pokemon-like creatures. As a result, you're able to earn this native um, SLP token, but because that token is minted on the blockchain, you're able to actually then go and sell that and own that. You fully own this currency. You can take it with you. It's interoperable. You can then sell it for Ethereum, Bitcoin, USD, you name it. And as well as the digital assets, or so the Pokemon-like creatures, the axes themselves. And so this has really changed how we can define games. It's actually more that you can look at these games, the virtual worlds that they will um, essentially populate as digitally native um, nation states with their own digital economies, with their own digital currencies. Um, and they were going to be widely interoperable. That's, you know, another big piece of this is the interoperability that this is now allowing for in the, um, in the internet, in internet. And so, you know, we've talked a lot about what NFTs are, what we think they're going to be used for, what they will be used for in the future. Um, but now let's talk about the flip side of the equation and talk about the creator side. So why as a creator, a business, would I want to put out a non-fungible token? Why would I want to interact in a Web3 ecosystem? And we think this is largely going to be driven because you now have one, that key point around digital ownership, but you're also going to be sharing much more in the economic gains of whatever your creation is, whether it be a piece of art, a collectible, a game itself, you now have much more say in how this is going to be monetized. Uh, do you want to monetize it just on the first sale of a digital good, or do you want to monetize it and the second sale, the third sale? All of this is up to you as the creator. And if you think about in the Web2 ecosystem, let's just use you know a YouTube creator as an example. I'm a YouTube creator. I release a video. I monetize it on YouTube. I don't have much say over how YouTube will monetize that video. I'm subjected to their rules. I'm subjected to their moderation. But in the Web3 ecosystem, you have decentralization acting as that buffer to make sure that you have full digital ownership of your assets and you can monetize how you want to. So we think this is a revolutionary shift uh, for creators. And so what does, what does this all mean? Well, as I had mentioned previously, we think that this is going to vastly accelerate the adoption and spend online. Um, so when we get into the Web2 and the digital consumer deck, we'll talk about a bit uh, about the Web2 ecosystem and how the centralized platforms are still going to be in, in good shape over the long term. But as decentralization, Web3, um, this concept of digital ownership continues to proliferate, we think that this can vastly increase the cost per hour monetization rate of online spend. So as you can see in this chart, that red line is with Web3 expenditures green line was, is without Web3 expenditures. So we're now compounding at 19% over the course of the next 10 years. Uh, without Web3, we're only at 8%. And so where does this additional spend come from? Well, we think people are at the margin are already starting to make decisions. Hey, do I want to spend on luxury goods in the real world? Or do I want to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on a board ape in the digital world? And what does that mean? Well, we think one, as we spend more time online, our digital lives, our digital identities are going to mean more and our willingness to spend now online is going to increase because we have full ownership of those assets. We are not subjected to the rules of a Facebook and Instagram, a Twitter, a centralized platform. We actually have full ownership of these assets. So our willingness to spend is going to increase. And in this scenario where Web3 proliferates and expands greatly, we've actually modeled that, you know, we could see a peak of offline expenditures in this next decade. That's not to say we will, this is just, you know, one scenario that we've kind of battle tested to see, you know, if Web3 takes off the, in a way that it could, 
you know, what would it mean and where would this spend come from? And we think at the margin, it's going to be decisions like, hey, I don't want to buy that in the real world. I'd rather buy, you know, a digital equivalent in this virtual world. I already spend hours and hours a day in or on. And so, you know, what do we get here? Well, we have, you know, trillions of dollars at risk. Um, you know, the Web3 adoption is going to grow and could make the online annual expenditures um, by the end of this decade, roughly 12 and a half trillion. So growing at 28% compound annual growth. Um, and as you can see in this chart on the left, you know, we could see a peak in offline expenditures as a result of that adoption. Um, but without it, you still would see, you know, the offline expenditures grow at a healthy clip. So still nearing 55 trillion. Um, but with Web3, that is going to come down and it will roughly flatten out around 49, tr or, yeah, 49 trillion uh, by the end of this decade. So uh, with that, I'd like to hand it back over. Thank you guys uh, so much for listening in. It was a pleasure. Um, and you can catch me back on here in about an hour to go over the digital consumer section.